A baby's first cry has always been a symbol of celebration and an assurance of good health. There's a word for it, vaginitis. Some babies may take a bit longer than others to start crying after birth, but what about those who start crying before they get out of the uterus? It was shortly after midnight on October 25, 1932, when Dr. Robert Watson was called to assist at a birth. The mother was 32 years old and in labor with her seventh child. She was fully dilated and effaced. The baby was presenting as a frank breach. Her contractions were strong, but the baby still was quote, above the brim, unquote. The nurse gave the mother chloroform. The doctor pulled down one of the fetal legs by the foot. After turning to get something, quote, my back was towards the bed when I heard just such a muffled cry as comes from the newborn infant in a blanket. I whipped around. The nurse looked startled. We both bent over the anesthetized woman and heard noises, unmistakable, familiar, from the woman's abdomen. They were simple baby noises, natural in tone, not urgent, suggesting no distress, unquote. But recognizing the danger to the baby, the nurse and doctor worked very quickly to pull the baby out. A chunk of a boy at 11 pounds and 12 and a half ounces, or 5.3 kilograms, and he was breathing well. Dr. Watson tried to account for how the baby could have audibly cried before it was born, with its face at the top of the uterus. He theorized that air got into the uterus when he was reaching in to manipulate the baby's leg, and the baby, already in some distress, took its first breath and cried while still in the womb. It was a case of vaginitis uterinus. Today we know from imaging studies that the fetus reflexively practices limb movements and facial expressions and crying in the womb, but because there isn't any air moving across the fetal vocal cords due to the amniotic fluid, at least until the water breaks, there are no audible sounds to the crying. Immediately after birth, whether vaginal or c-section, the exposure of a baby's body to room air triggers a reflex to take a breath and cry. This cry is called vaginitis, named after the Roman god Vagitanus, who teaches newborns to cry. It helps clear and expand the lungs, but this is an oversimplification. Quote, the transition from fetus to a newborn is the most complex physiological adaptation that occurs in human experience, unquote. The process involves all organ systems, including the skin, the endocrine system, and the hypothalamus. And once this process begins, it's not supposed to reverse itself. During pregnancy, the fetus receives oxygen and nutrients and expels carbon dioxide and waste products through the placenta via the umbilical cord, which is tapped into the maternal blood supply. If something happens to the placenta or the umbilical cord, it can cause the baby to asphyxiate if it cannot breathe on its own due to its immaturity or its environment, for example, if it's still in the womb, with or without amniotic fluid. In short, if a baby isn't born yet, and needs to or is triggered to breathe, they are unlikely to survive unless they can be delivered immediately. For example, in 1924, C.S. Morton of Halifax attempted a vaginal examination causing the as yet unborn baby to cry out. And even though the doctor worked very quickly to deliver the baby, it still took too long and the baby suffocated and was stillborn. This risk of suffocation resulting in a stillbirth was what Dr. Clauston understood when on November 10th, 1931, he was called to the stalled labor by the district nurse at around 8.30 a.m. His patient had gone into labor the previous night around 10 p.m. and was having her third baby. The previous two births had been uncomplicated. She was fully effaced and dilated, but she wasn't having contractions and the baby was engaged in a brow presentation. Brow presentations occur one in every 2,000 births and it's associated associated with back labor and nuchal cords, and that's when the umbilical wraps around the baby's neck. So Dr. Clausen wanted to move the baby's head into a face presentation, but it wouldn't budge. Then, quote, as I was withdrawing my hand after the vaginal examination, the child began to cry. It was normal crying of a newly born infant, and it was heard not only by the mother, the nurse, and myself, but also a woman in the cottage room directly below the bedroom, unquote. The crying continued at frequent intervals for about a minute. In a hurry, he told the nurse to administer chloroform so that he could use forceps to deliver the baby as soon as possible, but the nurse couldn't or wouldn't put the mother completely under and the baby wasn't budging. It also hadn't cried again. Dr. Clausen eventually called it. 
The baby had to have suffocated before birth and there was no more need to rush and so he called for his wife who was better qualified to administer chloroform. While they waited for her to arrive, the doctor did another examination and was shocked to hear a fetal heartbeat. Twins? He palpitated the abdomen but could only make out one fetal body. When his wife arrived, the mother was having moderate contractions again and was put completely under while Dr. Clauston attempted to remove the baby. This time he was able to get his hands around the fetal head to reposition it and his finger slipped into the baby's mouth and the baby bit down. Dr. Clauston rushed to get his forceps and delivered the baby at 1 p.m. alive four hours after they had heard its cries. The experiences of many doctors who witnessed vaginitis uterinus only to deliver living babies hours later did cause some curiosity about whether fetuses could alternate between pulmonary respiration, breathing room air, and placental blood oxygenation. On February 2, 1904, Dr. A. Frazier was called to a delivery of a 25-year-old first-time mother by the local nurse. The patient had come to the nurse's attention after having been in labor a full week under the care of a, and Dr. Frazier added scare quotes here, a lay midwife, unquote, unscare quote. <laughs> the nurse did not know when the patient's water had broken as it was broken before she had arrived. Dr. Frazier noted that the patient looked healthy but was exhausted and in considerable pain with a pulse of 116 beats per minute. The Oz, her cervical opening, was only dilated to the size of a five shilling piece, which is one and a half inches or about 3.8 centimeters, and she was uneffaced. Therefore, I can imagine those examinations were excruciating for her, and there's no note of chloroform being used in this case. Doesn't mean it wasn't, they just didn't mention it. Dr. Frazier agreed with the nurse's diagnosis of a brow presentation and so attempted to move the fetal head, but it didn't work. So he had the mother change position and then it happened. Quote, after she assumed this posture, a series of plaintive cries were heard to come from the vagina. The patient herself heard them and recognized their source, and they could be heard at the other side of the room. Unquote. Dr. Frazier reported on the options for getting the baby out as soon as possible that flooded his brain at that moment and he decided on the least injurious to the mother because he didn't believe that baby could be born alive even with surgical interventions because of the prep time involved. So he went with version, which means reaching into the uterus, grabbing a fetal foot, and pulling. He used traction while the nurse pressed on the mother's abdomen. It took 90 minutes of work to get the baby out, most of which time the baby's own body was completely blocking any air entering the womb. The baby was born, cyanosed, which blew, but it gasped. It was still alive. The doctor and the nurse gave the baby artificial ventilation for quote, some time, unquote, and then gave an injection of 1 60th of a grain of strychnine, which they credited with helping the baby's breathing becoming regular. The issue that nagged at Dr. Frazier was how did the baby survive without breathing for over an hour after it had clearly begun breathing in order to cry? So he wrote, quote, the prognosis ultimately depends on the ability of the child's left ventricle to maintain the placental circulation during the, that part of the delivery when pulmonary respiration is not possible. It is possible that in some of the cases, the circulation may resort to the fetal type after the cessation of the cries, unquote. Now, if I had heard my baby crying in the womb and my doctor or midwife failed to suggest it within seconds, I would probably be screaming down the place for a C-section. However, in multiple historical cases of vaginitis uterinus, the doctor felt that there just wasn't enough time for a C-section, just like Dr. Frazier. For example, Dr. Ryder made a similar choice in 1923 after hearing a fetus crying and gurgling in the uterus. He had promised his patient, whose first child suffered herbs palsy after a difficult assisted delivery, and her second child was killed by misapplied forceps. He promised her that if this labor was difficult, this time they would just opt for a C-section, and that's what they were about to do when, quote, with the stethoscope on the patient's abdomen, immediately most amazing sounds were heard. Very plainly, the fetus could be heard crying loudly. The sounds were high and squeaking, much like the mew of a kitten. When the crying stopped, the fetus could be heard breathing with gurgling respirations, as though choking with fluid. 
Both assistant and nurses listened and heard plainly the crying and breathing. It seemed probable that the fetus would inspire too much liquor omni in spite of the ruptured membranes and it was considered unwise to wait for the section. So the patient was replaced in the lithotomy position, the ether resumed, and by internal podlic version, the presentation was changed to a breach. The breach extraction was performed slowly and carefully and resulted in the birth of an undamaged baby, which was soon revived and crying lustily." Unquote. But not all medical professionals seem to take the need for speed seriously. In an earlier case report in the British Medical Journal from February 4, 1905, Dr. Temple Smith and his colleague had been called to the delivery of a 40-year-old experienced mother who was dilated and having strong, regular contractions for, quote, some time, unquote. But the fetal head wasn't, quote, below the brim, unquote. They gave her chloroform and proceeded to manually examine the position of the fetus and found the issue. Its arm was stuck up behind its head and it had no intention of allowing them to move it. So they decided to do a version, again, spinning the entire fetus around to force a breech birth. This was a very common intervention at the time. It was second only to forceps. Anyway, as Dr. Smith reached for the fetal knee, everyone, Dr. Smith, his colleague, the attending nurse, heard it. The fetus cried. But they simply continued their work, getting together a tape to tie around the fetal ankle, the application of which caused the fetus to cry out again. This time, they noted the time. It was 8.30 a.m. Unlike other doctors, Dr. Smith and company were in no rush. They spun the baby around and then they just waited for the contractions to do the rest. Three hours later, the baby was born with a small amount of traction on the breech because it was a big baby. And they noted that it was born, quote, somewhat asphyxiated, unquote, but the, quote, normal measures, unquote, got it breathing. And a year later, they said that the baby was a normal, thriving toddler. In the 1928 textbook, Principles and Practices of Obstetrics, by Dr. Joseph B. D. Lee, a professor of obstetrics at Northwestern University, he said of vaginus uterinus, quote, this term has been applied to the crying of the child in utero before it is born. Many authentic cases are on record. If air is introduced into the uterine cavity alongside the hand as in version or with instruments or by simple examination, or if gases develop there, the child may inspire and on expiration produce a cry. Sometimes this may occur with or without ev evidence of dyspnea, and the child may be delivered in good condition, sometimes hours or days afterwards." Unquote. I was pretty shocked about the days afterwards, and only to read another article from 1951 in the British Medical Journal, where they claimed that in Ryder's 1943 study, the longest interval between vaginus uterinus and a live birth was two weeks. But more on that two-week outlier in a bit. These contradictory case reports and descriptions are very confusing. Vaginus uterinus is, except in that one case, considered a medical emergency. Yet babies are being born alive hours, days, or even weeks later. What was the medical consensus? Was there even one? In 1903, Dr. Pizer reported on 15 cases of vaginus uterinus, including his own experience, in which the baby cried while he was, and I quote, exploring, unquote, during a vaginal exam. He gave the mother chloroform so he could do another vaginal exam. I don't know about you, but I'm not trusting this guy. <laughs> and the baby cried again. After a quick delivery via forceps, he concluded that vaginus uterinus was, quote, by no means unfavorable to the fetus, unquote. But his contemporary, Dr. Marx, who was from America, disagreed. He had had experience with vaginus uterinus himself during a forceps delivery, describing the crying as, quote, the weirdest cry for help imaginable, unquote, and determined that most, if not all, the children who exhibit it are lost before they can be delivered. In October of 1913, Dr. Telfair published a report in the New York Medical Journal. He compiled 44 cases of vaginus uterinus, over half were operative cases, 11 were forceps, 15 versions, and one involved moving the fetal limbs in cord. Based on his analysis, the fetal mortality rate was 10%, but the survivors often required extensive resuscitation. A later analysis by George Ryder in that 1943 study showed historical mortality rates of 19%, with recent to his time mortality of around 12%. 
So in the first decades of the 20th century, there were so many case reports flooding into medical journals across Europe and North America that it seemed like vaginitis uterinus was an accepted, although rare and potentially risky occurrence by the medical community. But there was some pushback. In Dr. Telfer's 1913 report, he also noted that the case reports of vaginitis uterinus quote, had aroused a storm of criticism, sometimes ridicule. The bitterest usually came from obstetricians of wide experience. These men frankly said that they had never seen a case of vaginitis uterinus, and they did not believe anyone else had, unquote. Dr. Sippel, a vaginitis uterinus skeptic, had a case in which he heard noise from the vagina during examination, but his theory was that it was the vibration of a quote, fold of mucous membrane, unquote, as the air was sucked into or out of the uterus. Clausen's article summarized his theory, quote, there seems usually to be a flabby uterus on one hand and an obstetrical operator emitting air into its cavity on the other, unquote. In other words, Dr. Sippel rejects all claims of vaginitis uterinus as queefs mistaken for baby cries. In 1947, the U.S. Army was so bamboozled by these epic queefs that they published two case reports on it. Out of 499 births that took place at the AAF Regional Station Hospital in Mitchell Field, New York in 1945, two involved vaginitis uterinus. In the one case, which took place on January 26th, the 31-year-old first-time mom was given an epidural, and when the doctor applied forceps, quote, the fetus made several cries which were audible to five individuals, including the patient, who inquired whether her child was a boy or a girl, unquote. But it took another seven contractions with the forceps before the baby, which was a boy, six pounds, eight ounces, or 2.9 kilograms, was born at 5.21 p.m., the witnesses to the vaginitis uterinus signed affidavits. Mother and baby left the hospital after an uneventful postpartum stay of nine days. But there were some cases described that were clearly not vaginitis uterinus. Another Dr. Fraser gave a presentation on July 27, 1864, before the Obstetrical Society of Edinburgh about a case of what he considered true vaginitis uterinus. Quote, by the term vaginitis uterinus, I suppose is meant not the crying of the child after the rupture of membranes when the external air can reach it, virtually a phase of extra uterine life, but the crying of the fetus in utero while the ovum is entire. Unquote. To translate, Dr. Fraser believes that only vaginitis heard before the water breaks is true vaginitis uterinus. Otherwise, it's just sparkling queef. What he suggests is not possible because the vocal cords cannot make sound without air. But he believed that one of his patients experienced this not just once, but during two pregnancies. The first occurrence was during her first pregnancy, about 10 to 12 days before the due date. She was lying in bed trying to relax, her unborn baby doing fetal equivalent of parkour, while her husband read from the Bible next to her. Quote, all at once they heard with amazement a cry like that of a newborn babe. Though somewhat muffled, the sound was yet so distinct and so evidently arose from the place beside him that Mr. G could not help exclaiming, mercy on us is the child in the world, unquote. Mrs. G was certain that one, she had not given birth, and two, that sound was definitely from their unborn baby and nowhere else. They were both overcome with emotion. It was their first baby's first cry. The birth, when it finally took place two weeks later, and this is where I think Ryder got that vaginitis uterinus to live birth interval, was normal. A healthy boy. Over the next few years, she had two more babies with no vaginitis uteritis of any definition. But in her fourth pregnancy, in a very similar situation to the first, about a week before she was due, while relaxing on the couch after the children were gone to bed, this baby also doing parkour off her internal organs, her husband was sitting around 10 feet away reading, quote, when she heard a sound like the bleeding cry of a newborn baby, which seemed to come from her womb and which she is positive did come from that part. Her husband also heard it where he was sitting and so distinctly that dropping his book, he started to his feet and thought for a moment that the child was really born, unquote. They didn't hear the sound again, and she had a normal birth, this time a baby girl, followed by two more quiet pregnancies. I'm sure that many of you already have a theory about what that sound was and from whence it came, but the lovely dears at the Obstetrical Society of Edinburgh 
bless them, had follow-up questions. Quote, both instances occurred when the mother was at rest. Is quietness on her part necessary to the production of the sound? Is it not likely that instances pass unnoticed during sleep? Whence the air which enables the fetus to cry? Is it excreted by the child itself or by the membranes? Unquote. When this presentation was published in the Edinburgh Medical Journal in November of 1864, the editor added a note. Quote, if it be admitted that a child can cry in utero, it must also be admitted that the lungs can be more or less expanded before birth, though the child be afterwards born dead. Hence, another reason for caution in judging from the hydrostatic test, unquote. Now that last question gets into Scotland's draconian laws on concealed pregnancy, abortion, and infant side, but I only include it to show the apparent credulity of these medical professionals. However, when, when it was republished by the Americans, they addressed the gassy elephant in the room. Quote, we are induced to ask another question. Was not the sound produced by the movement of air in the bowels? Unquote. <laughs> In April of 1933, Dr. Matheson wrote into the British Medical Journal about his own experience in November of 1909, and he added that while Iceland's and Denmark's medical communities more or less ignored his case reports, after publishing them in a lay newspaper, he received many letters describing vaginus uterinus experiences, especially from farmers who said that they had heard it in cows during prolonged labors. And an elderly woman told him that the phenomenon was described in dogs in the Icelandic sagas as a portent of great events. Quote, the whelps barked within the wombs of the quacks. Unquote. Dr. Malcolm McLean reported that in 1898, while he and his colleagues and nurses were prepping the patient for a C-section in an operating theater, he performed a vaginal examination to make sure the baby's head was still in the uterus, and as he withdrew his hand, there was some suction, and he, quote, was astounded to hear the baby cry, unquote. The crying continued for several minutes, which everyone in the operating theater heard, and, quote, there was a superstitious nurse, nurse present who spent much of her time on her knees, unquote. In Gedz's small world, she noted that, quote, in the past, they would probably not have dared to admit what they heard because the rare occurrence of vaginus uterinus was believed to be caused by midwifely witchcraft, unquote. I tried to find more examples of superstitions around the phenomenon, including midwifely witchcraft, but I wasn't successful. It's possible that vaginus uterinus was so rare and prior to modern obstetrics and neonatal resuscitation that few of the babies involved survive for a mythology to build upon. Do you have any stories about or experience with vaginus uterinus? Please share it in the comments or if you want to, you can send me an email. And if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe so you don't miss future videos. <laughs> and if you would like to support my research, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. And thank you for watching. Oh my god, my mouse died. I can never stop recording because my mouse died. Oh god. Oh, it's real dead. It's real dead, guys. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So the experiences, the experiences, ah, uh, itchy, itchy, itchy face. <laughs> okay. The experiences of many doctors who witness vagi vagitis, 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 vagitis. Oh my God. Okay. Yes. <laughs> to deliver living babies hours later did cause some con cure. Da -da 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 did cause some co I cannot talk. <laughs> uh. There was a superstitious nurse present who spent much of her time on her knees, unquote. Praying. <laughs> uh, I just lost my train of thought, okay.